Chapter 5 of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 The repose of Sidmouth disturbed by a man of enterprise. He gets up a regatta, and to avoid being mixed up in it, I go to sea in the foam for the day. But, after all, owing to bad weather, do get mixed with it, and sail round the course with two other boats. How Sidmouth was supplied with coals. The foam launched to board a light collier caught in a breeze. Rowing out through a sea, a vessel drives ashore, night of royal charter gale. Some beer men land on the beach at night in heavy gale. England's rose, driven to sea with a gentleman and two ladies towed back by foam. I build a smaller boat as tender to foam. A year later begin to think of building a vessel large enough to leave Sidmouth in. Her dimensions, etc. Other reasons for building her instead of buying one. I begin to take long walks with a boat builder to find timber for this vessel. I buy a big tree, the felling of it, and getting it upon a saw pit. No railway in my time came within fifteen miles of Sidmouth, and the few enterprising visitors who reached there by coach from Exeter called it dull. It was certainly not a gay place, but most of those who resided in that happy valley did so rather with a view to quiet, and among them it was rare to find any one disposed to tamper with the grave routine of country life there. In the summer, however, of blank, there blazed out among us a brisk retired north country ship owner who bought a little place and after blowing off some superfluous energy upon it for a year in altering and adding to it and driving a pair of ponies up and down the steep adjacent hills began to attack people all round on the want of enterprise and energy in their slow southern town. Why didn't they build a pier? Or, seeing how cheap and plentiful timber was, start a shipbuilding yard? When did we have our last regatta? And being told we never had one, said... Then it's time you did. He owned a twenty-ton yacht and was vice commodore of the Royal Something Yacht Club, and no doubt all the members of that club would enter their craft. And so a committee was dragged together and money to the amount of fifty pounds collected to be expended in prizes, flags, and fireworks. What are termed coast regattas are common enough, and sometimes the weather permits of the program being carried out. But Sidmouth was far from any yachting centers, while its position in West Bay made it a most undesirable rendezvous for racing craft. This, of course, the fishermen knew, 
and therefore expected that the money subscribed would be duly divided into a number of prizes to be rowed and sailed for by them. The committee, however, thought otherwise, and after allotting thirty pounds to be sailed for by the expected yachts, and ten pounds for fireworks, etc., divided the remaining ten pounds into small prizes for local boats. When this was known on the beach, the regatta and its committee became a very unpopular subject of conversation among the fishermen. A day in September, however, was fixed, and the forthcoming Sidmouth Regatta was duly advertised in a local weekly. I had been asked to help to carry out the sailing arrangements among the fishing boats, but knowing the dissatisfaction likely to follow any attempt to do so declined, and to make sure of not being pressed into this service put to sea in the foam on the appointed day before most of the sailing committee were out of bid. And having victualled my boat for the day, started with one of the fishermen's sons for a cruise seaward. As the day advanced, the wind steadily grew stronger, and by ten o'clock there was a fair amount of surf on the beach, so that some trouble was experienced in launching three of the eighteen-foot fishing boats. Two mark boats had been anchored the evening before, four miles apart, to the eastward and westward of the town, and about two miles offshore. So far, however, no yacht of any rig was in sight, and the fishermen in the boats already afloat told me that none of the smaller ones were likely to leave the beach in the present state of the weather. About noon, however, the vice commodores, twenty-tonner, under a trysail and a small jib, hove in sight followed by a smaller cutter and a very large half-decked sailing craft, the Swan of the Warren, from Exmouth. The weather showed no signs of improving, and communication with the shore was fast getting more difficult, even when carried out in boats manned by three or four of the smartest fishermen. I don't know what arrangements were made at sea about a match between the yachts. But about 1 p.m. they started themselves somehow. The Swan of the Warren leading the way round the course, followed by the Little Cutter and Twenty Tonner. The weather had now become not only rough, but very thick, with small rain so that the yachts were not easily seen as they sailed round the course. And when the three eighteen-foot boats slipped their cables and dashed off under their forelugs and mizzens for the eastern mark, they were soon out of sight in the rain and sea drift. So that, as seen now from the shore, it must have been a very dim and mysterious-looking regatta indeed. Rather to my surprise, I now saw two of the sixteen-foot boats afloat, and a boat from the shore came out to me to ask whether, in order to make up a race, I would sail round the course with these two boats, as none of the other small boats would leave the beach. These boats had each three men in them, and I agreed to go if they could find me another hand. The men were much obliged, and said that my friend Mr. G., the son of a clergyman, was on the beach, and no doubt would be glad to go. 
He was a first-rate hand, and after some delay joined me in the foam. The sea had gone on rising, so that as we lay ready for a start at our anchors, about a quarter of a mile from the town, it was not easy to see anything far, either shoreward or seaward and the two boats riding just inside of mine were often almost hidden from us by the shoulder of a passing sea, while the roar of the surf among the shingle quite drowned the sound of our starting gun. I fancied I saw a puff of smoke but could not make the men in the other boats believe it had been fired, until I pointed out to them a signal made by flag that it had. We were all soon off after that, and though, owing to her rig and smaller size, my boat had no chance against the fishermen's lug sails, we hoped by the way we went soon after starting that we might come in a good second. But the weather had become so thick that in the rain and driving spray it was impossible to see either of the mark boats. We therefore followed the boat ahead of us, knowing that he would sight the easterly mark first. And we were not far astern of him when my friend G., may out an empty boat on the top of a sea only a short distance to windward of us, and said, By Jove, there she is, and Ned, alluding to the leading boat, has gone on without twigging her. We then stood on just far enough to round this boat, and went about close to her, but only to find that she was one of the yacht's boats adrift, and that the real mark boat was a quarter of a mile from us and still ahead of the leading boat. This, of course, put us out of the race, even as second, for we had to tack again before rounding this first mark just astern of the second boat. It was a long, rough, four miles sail to the western mark, and we might have claimed second prize after all, for we saw the second boat tack for shore without rounding it at all. During this cruise round we were constantly bailing, the boy with a dipper and my friend with a sea boot. We found any amount of help ready for us on the beach that day, and by the time we landed the wind had increased to half a gale. The three yachts were almost out of sight, making the best of their way for Exmouth under storm canvas. The little north country yachtsman was not afloat in his yacht that day, and in the local weekly's account of the regatta it was said, after the first round the race was given up, as those on board the twenty-tonner could see no fun in knocking about pitching bowsprit in off a place like Sidmouth. Thus ended the first and last coast regatta I ever took part in. In the earlier part of the day, an effort was made to start a race for gigs, and two were very pluckily manned and launched, but had to make for shore again, one of them filling outside, and her crew were taken care of by the men in one of the larger fishing boats. The cut shows how the other took the beach head first. Sidmouth was then only supplied with coal by sea, landed in large boats on the beach from collier brigs anchored nearly half a mile offshore. And one of the small excitements of the place was when one of these coal brigs, after discharging her cargo, was caught by a southerly breeze either empty or before she had taken in ballast. During a stay off Sidmouth, 
these vessels were placed in charge of one of the older beachmen, who for the time was styled pilot. His local knowledge of tides and weather being considered useful, while his boat in bad weather formed the most efficient link between him and the shore. Harry Conant was one of these men chosen for this service, and at times had to go off and remain on board a collier until the weather moderated, or if sufficient ballast in the shape of undischarged coal remained in her until she was safe inside of Exmouth Bar. But when caught quite empty, these vessels were sometimes left with two anchors down to take care of themselves until the gale was over. The questions, however, often arose at such times. Was the weather bad enough to take this step? Or how long would it be safe to leave the crew and pilot on board? It chanced that one morning I with many others was on the beach during a discussion of this kind. A light collier with nearly a clean swept hold was riding rather heavily off the town. Her crew had been landed the night before, leaving the captain and a Sidmouth man on board, and the question was, should a boat be launched to go off and offer them a chance of leaving the brig before the sea became too heavy? Very little time was wasted in talk before Conant and his relative Ned decided to go. It so happened that most of the handier small class of boats suited for the trip, except the foam, had been hauled that morning off the beach on to the esplanade, and Ned suggested that if I would let her go, she would be just the boat for the job. I confess that I felt rather flattered at this selection, and said, they might take her if they would take me with them. My friend G, who was standing near, also wished to go, and after some hesitation on Conant's part, it was agreed that we should form two of the four hands required to pull off to the brig. I had landed in the foam several times in quite as heavy a sea, but was anxious not to lose the rarer chance of launching through one, especially in the little foam. She was, as they said, one of the floatiest boats on the beach, and lay handy with no fishing gear on board. There was plenty of help ready to launch her, and after she was down on the skids, just in the white broad wash of the surf, my friend and I took our places at the two midship oars, Ned being the lightest of the party taking the bow oar, while Conant was to take charge of the tiller with one hand and the after oar in the other, which he used standing in the stern sheets and sheaving or shoving with it facing the boat's bow, gondolier fashion. In this way he was able to see well ahead and direct us when to pull hard or easy according to the height and character of the surf. It was some minutes before he gave the word to those lending a hand at our launch of, Here comes a pretty smooth, mind and follow her well out, which he did himself almost waist high before jumping into her over the stern. The first rush down with the back suck or undertow of the wave as it carries the little boat forward to meet the curling crest of the next is a ticklish moment. 
the shallow, yeasty mixture of air and water gives little grip for oars, and two or more strokes are made rather in the sand and shingle below it. This first sea must be taken at speed, and a cloud of spray almost hides our bowman, as the boat crushes her way through and over it. While for the next two or three seas, Conant coaches us with, Pull up, pull up, Mr. L. Pull up hard, Mr. G. Keep her going, etc. But as we get farther seaward, the interval between each breaker grows longer, and when a higher wall of water than usual rises some distance ahead of us, Conant's order at times is, Easy a bit, we'll let that one break. Then at the next it is, Pull up hard again all. This went on until we were past the wide belt of broken water which extended nearly halfway out to the brig, after which it was only steady hard work for all hands, until we were as close under the lee of the light collier's tossing stern as we dared go. The men on board threw us a line, and we rested on our oars while Conant climbed on board the brig by it and a short rope ladder hanging astern. What took place in that collier's little cabin I am unable to say, but it was quite half an hour before the debate was over and Conant dropped down the line again into the foam with a letter to be posted for the captain's wife and the news that he and the pilot had decided to bide where they was. The return trip, before wind and sea, though easier for us, required more care than the outward one. The wind veered next day to northwest, and the old brig was ballasted and sailed for the north again two days afterwards. In fact, during the twelve years I was at Sidmouth, none of these colliers were lost there, though several other vessels drove ashore at or near the place. One of these, a large, timber-laden ketch, came ashore the night the Royal Charter was lost, and was thrown up on the beach almost level with the top of the sea wall or far above ordinary high-water mark. Her owner, a Jersey shipbuilder, relaunched her with her cargo on board two months afterwards. But curiously enough, two years later, the same catch, laden with oak timber, drove ashore again within a mile of Sidmouth, after losing all her canvas off Berryhead, and was again relaunched with little or no damage. I remember also a tremendously heavy gale, in which one of the beerhead luggers got caught in the broken water outside Sidmouth about midnight, and seeing the gaslights of the town, ran for the beach and without help made a safe landing upon it. It was a fearful night, and I and others were astonished next morning at finding the stranger high up on the beach, with her crew of three men on board, one of whom must have been eighty years old, quietly mending their nets and gear. But to return to my own little affairs, I may say that the foam's trip to the light collier was not the only time she took a share in useful work, for I had the honor on one occasion of taking four kegs of Her Majesty's powder from Sidmouth to the Coast Guard station at Budley Salterton and another day the foam was the happy instrument of 
I won't say rescuing two ladies and a gentleman from a watery grave, but from the far more awkward fate of being blown alive out to sea in a small open boat, in which, after starting for a row and pulling, or rather drifting, for some time pleasantly before the wind, the gentleman, in spite of all efforts to regain the land, found himself, like Crusoe in his pirogue, fast drifting seaward. I was not surprised at this, because, on coming within a few yards to windward of him in the foam, he was quite incapable of pulling his boat near enough for me to get hold of her. There were two elderly ladies sitting in the stern of the boat, under parasols, and their companion, who had lost his hat, was bald-headed. The boat he had hired was Conant's England's Rose, and when I reached Sidmouth with her in tow, he said, I was afeard after I let the gent take her something would happen when I see how he rode away dead to leeward. I have often thought since that if that little party on board England's Rose had only been twenty years younger, it would have been a pity to have spoilt such a good opening for a three-volume sea story by towing their boat ashore. Though the foam was a small boat to require the attentions of a tender or dinghy, there were, during summer at Sidmouth, spells of offshore winds with smooth water in which she could be safely left at anchor with ballast and gear on board ready for sea. I therefore now built the foam's little sister, or tender, a handy full-bodied boat eleven feet and a half long by four wide. After a short training on Sidmouth Beach, as tender to the foam, she began a wandering life as the boat or dinghy of the Rip Van Winkle, the keel and planking of which celebrated craft was standing as a fine elm close to my house two years after this dinghy was built. The Rip Van Winkle was a craft of 36 tons old measurement and I believe twenty decimal something register. But the tonnage of ships, like a lady's age, is not easily got at even by experts. She was certainly forty-five feet long overall by fourteen wide, and drew a little over six feet of water, and was christened Rip Van Winkle, because in her we first really drifted clear of or away from a long, sleepy twelve years' repose in the valley of the Cid. We might perhaps have effected an escape by other means, but they did not occur to us, or we wanted the energy to use them. It is, however, even now rather a mystery to me why or how I came to build her. My wife never cared for the sea, and my own idea is that this vessel was the result of sheer idleness. There is or was a foolish saying that time is money, which may have some truth in London or New York, but had no local truth about it for me at Sidmouth, and though I turned much time and some money into yacht when I built Rip Van Winkle, I did not find it easy to convert yacht into either again on trying to sell her some years afterwards. 
She took me over two years to build, being taken in, so to say, in monthly parts, as people of humble means do a big, expensively bound and illustrated Bible. Or the working man does his pig, which grows by little and littles, and comes in in a lump after eating its last peck of barley meal at Christmas. Of course, for ready money, I might have acquired my yacht in a lump, advertising for her in the field, or the yachtsman, and have gone to Cowes, Southampton, or Wyvenhoe, and after some scientific progs with a knife among her timbers, and going through her inventory from a nearly new mainsail to a rusty frying pan, have become her owner at what the local agent says, Ain't the valley of her lead, the all and gear being chucked in for nothing. But even such bargains are not always cheap, and the man whose time is really money had better turn some of it into a good yacht builder's pockets, when, after seeing his vessel on paper in all the glory of a polished half-block model, he will in two or three months find himself in possession of a magnificent craft, radiant in polished teak, mahogany, and brasswork, to be manned by an extravagant skipper and crew who will rule over him and his ship from the moment she is fitted out until laid up again on the mud. Such a vessel would have cost more in a season to fit out and cruise in than the Rip Van Winkle did to build at Sidmouth, where not only was timber cheap, but the help of a good boat builder could then be had for eighteen shillings a week. When, like Crusoe or Peter the Great, you have once turned shipwright on your own account, it is curious what an interest the standing or felled timber of neighbors and friends has for you and how you go about with a measuring tape and two-foot rule, and calculate the cubic contents, etc., of their timber. Or again, how interesting country walks become, especially in the company of your new ally, the boat builder. There, he says, is that great elm in Farmer Grip's orchard hedge which, if it don't open full of rampin' big knots, which Edge Ellums is liable to, will cut our keel in one, and what's left of the clean tough butt ought to make enough inch stuff to aft plank or bottom. As he allows that tree have got over a hundred and thirty foot of solid timber in it, let alone top and lop what'll pay for felon. The acquisition, however, of even a large tree is surrounded with small difficulties. The tenant farmer would be glad to be rid of the toady elm what's been killin' of two of his best red streaked apple trees for years. But it don't lay along of he, and Miss C., his landlady can't abide to cut a stick of timber. Everything, however, comes to him who can wait. And after some months, even Miss C., as a personal friend, was induced to part with her big elm at blank per foot, provided she was secured against all damage it might cause in its fall to neighbor B's garden hedge. Now, though a first-rate hand at his own trade, the boat builder was wanting in the nerve and knowledge of woodcraft of a certain eminent statesman, 
especially when risk to other people's property was involved, and would sooner let a big tree alone than have anything to do with the risky job of felling it. The aid, therefore, of a tough, sturdy old wheelwright was called in, who minded that tree fifty year agone, where he were a youngster, and it wasn't bigger than an overgrowed hedge stake. Even this experienced forester would, however, not touch the job until the damp early winter weather had hardened up a bit, or the road was bound firm and dry by frost. Anything is fun in the country, particularly in the short days after Christmas when farm work is at a standstill, and the throwing of a large tree is then a local event, like a ship launch, important enough to attract a crowd of idlers, including a flock of school children and the village idiot. While the farmer is glad of a job for his team in moving the tree when down, either seaward or to the old wheelwright's attack upon a tree in such a position was not made until, like a good general, he had taken rough bearings of everything within reach of its fall. While even a slight change in a light winter breeze, indicated by the drift of blue smoke from a farm chimney, does not escape his notice. Once, however, the plan of assault is settled, he and his big apprentice, with heavy axes, soon hew a gaping wound close down to the broad spreading base of the elm. And a rope, having been made fast high in a topmost fork, there is no scarcity of strong arms ready for a pull on it, or of advice as to the direction their efforts should take. All traffic on the road has been at a standstill for nearly half an hour before the word is given. Stand clear all! Followed by, Now then, all together! Once more, all together now. And there is a sound of cracking in the hedge as the great tree sways for a moment before, with a crash of huge broken limbs, the first number of our yacht lies prostrate on the frosty road so that upon the side on which it has fallen scarcely a branch remains to be cut away. The boat builder is, of course, the first to observe. That one large limb have cut an ugly gap in Squire B's hedge after all. But no one minds this or him now as they gather round a bright can of foaming ale, and the old wheelwright is the hero of the moment, all arguing that things have turned out better nor they expected, while even the timid boat builder no longer fears the fallen tree but boldly attacks the top and lop with an axe preparatory to the removal of the huge trunk out of the Queen's Highway, after which the heavy butt-end is scientifically slung between the lofty wheels of a timber carriage and drawn by the farmer's team into a neighboring meadow. The boat builder remarking to me truly enough that it aren't altogether the price that makes a big tree expensive as the money it runs into every time you touches of it.
In order, therefore, to minimize this expense, a temporary saw pit was formed by deepening a dry ditch in the meadow where the tree lay, after which the old wheelwright and his apprentice, with the help of rollers, bored windlass fashion to receive handspikes, soon moved this unwieldy first number of the Rip Van Winkle on to the pit, ready for reduction into a keel piece and inch planking, which was then all left stacked to dry until the following summer. End of chapter 5